Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Corsair IQ 4000D RGB Airflow QL edition. That's right, this is the QL version of the 4000D Airflow, which means that it comes with four pre-installed QL120 fans for extra RGB lighting and convenience, and they are conveniently set up. And in this video, I'm going to be showing you the build process for this to end up with the result that I have here with the Corsair H100i Elite Caplix with the LCD upgrade kit and a number of other things, including some extra QL fans and some other interesting highlights. Now in this video, I'm going to be showing you the various accents of this case and talking about how it's pretty interesting and very easy to set up. I'm going to be talking through the various steps of the build process. And I'm obviously also going to do a separate video on the H100i Elite Caplix with that upgrade kit and the QL fans. So I'll link to that video in the description. But here I want to show off what's possible and what's interesting. Now I've obviously done the 4000D airflow guide already. I've also revisited the case and put Noctua fans in it. I'm also going to revisit that case again with the AF 120s. So lots of different fan setups. But in this video, I'm concentrating on the standard setup for the 4000D QL edition and talking about what it's like and what's included. Now, this is very much a similar case to the standard airflow edition from Corsair. Obviously, with the QL fans, pretty nice to see four QL 120s installed as standard. That's a very generous amount of fans, but obviously you are paying a premium for that. But it does mean that it's a lot more straightforward to get RGB lighting into your case with very little hassle because these are already set up and plugged in with an RGB setup at the rear that I'll show you in a second. Although you obviously do need to have some sort of power setup. And I'll talk to you about that as we go through. You'll see all the usual panels are removable, so you have access to everything, and it is very straightforward. Now, I really like the 4000D Airflow when I initially built in it, and it is a pretty decent case with a nice setup, and I have shown the tests and benchmarks on that to show the performance of it. Obviously, QL fans aren't necessarily the best in terms of airflow, but they are a good balance between airflow and aesthetics. Nice looking fans. Very quiet, still good looking, decent airflow, but not as high end as something like the ML120 Elite fans or Noctua's fans, for example. Get that rear panel off and you get access to the back. This is one of the highlights of this case is the design of the cable channeling and the management of things at the rear. There's also plenty of space. Now I'm going to leave all the specs of the case and also the build in the description. So if you're interested, check that out. But one of the things that I found interesting immediately is there's an RGB node at the rear here. So you'll see that it has spots for six fans. So you can connect up the RGB side of the fans into this control hub, then connect USB and SATA power to it then you have the RGB lighting set up, but you do not have the fan power. So it's worth noting that, and I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. Pull out the cables from the bottom, you'll find all the front panel connections as well. This includes the USB connection for that control box, front panel audio for the top of the case, as well as the USB-C and standard USB-A connections, the front panel power connections, and the other bits. And I'll show you the setup and where those plug in as well. So we'll go through that in a minute. But this is the standard USB connection, then your front panel audio connection, then your USB-C cable as well. And I will show all the positions for mounting these and installing these as we go through this video. And then you have the front panel power connections and also the USB connection. So that USB connection is coming from the RGB controller. You need to make sure you plug that into your motherboard if you're going to use that to control the RGB lighting. And then obviously those power cables allow you to control the power to the machine from the front panel connections. And then you have flat SATA power connection, which is used to give power to the RGB node. So that again, that needs to plug into your power supply unit. And then you will obviously also find the power connectors for the various fans. So you have four fans, so you have four cables that you need to plug in as standard. Now at the rear, you'll also find that there are two trays for 2.5 inch SSDs. You can mount your SSDs here, or you can take these trays out and actually put them on the front of the case. If you want more information on that, check out my 4000D airflow video, because I showed the position of where you can mount them. 
But in this build, I'm not going to be using any SSDs, but I will briefly show you what to do with a full hard disk drive. And take out the tray at the bottom and you'll get access to the accessories box. And this includes various different things. All the essential screws, cable ties and other things that you need are tucked away in here. And I'll show you what you need in terms of the screws and what's important in there in a minute. It's worth referring to the manual to check what's what. But you do get some extra Velcro ties as well as plastic cable ties to neaten things up. One of the things I do like about this case, depending on what you're putting in it, is there is quite a lot of space for the cable management and quite easy to set up process there. So the hard disk drive, it has two spots for 3.5 inch standard platter hard drives. Here I'm using one six terabyte drive just to demonstrate. It has clips on the inside that clip into your drive. You just need to make sure you place it the right way around and slot them in on the very edges. A little bit stiff, but it does mean that you don't have to worry about messing about with screws. It's a really easy clip in tray, basically, just popping it into place. And then you need to connect up the SATA power connection and the data connection. So the SATA power comes from the power supply unit. And I'll link to the PSU video in the description so you can find out more about that. And then you have the data connection that runs through to your motherboard. Really straightforward setup here. Also, the SATA power is daisy chainable. And note that because we're also going to be using that SATA power for the RGB connection or for a Commander Core XT when it comes to the fan setup a bit later on. So you can use that single cable with multiple points on it to power all these things. Anyway, you can slot your hard drive in there. So you can fit two standard platter hard drives in here and two SSDs if you so wish. So you have the option for a reasonable amount of storage at the rear depending on what you're doing. Now in this build, I'm using the Corsair RM750 power supply unit, which has a reasonable fit in it. I did find in the 4000D airflow that the 850 was a bit snug. So it was marginally bigger than this and a bit tricky. One of the things I would recommend is plugging all your cables in that you're gonna need before you start to mount your power supply unit. That makes life a lot easier. You can see there's not much room between the PSU and the cables, but you can actually move the cage forward for the hard disk drive tray towards the front of the case a little bit if you need the extra space. That's worth bearing in mind. You can also fully take it out if you don't plan on using it, which is also beneficial. So you can just take that out and you have more room for managing the cables. Then run the cables around the case into the direction you're going to need. I actually need three 8-pin CPU power connectors up here. So I'm running those around the side. And then you'll also find there are various points for channeling your cables and tying them down in here as well. So there are some nice cable tidying points. I usually recommend leaving tying cables up until the end so you make sure that they're all plugged in where they need to be and that you can access and change things around if you like. But I did put a couple on in here to tidy things down and also obviously the velcro ties make life a lot easier for temporarily putting cables into place and tying them down you will also note that the rgb cable is already plugged in but the power cables for the fans are also ray tied down which is interesting because we're going to have to actually take off some of the ties that are included now this is the commander core xt that's included the h100i Elite Caplix. This is a fan controller which works with both RGB and power. I've done a separate video on how to set up Corsair fans that I'll link to in the description. That'll be useful if you're not sure on how to wire up your Corsair fans and what to do. But in this case, essentially, I don't need to use the RGB node that's included with the case because it's more logical just to plug all the fans in. I'm going to be using into the Commander Core XT. I would recommend plugging them in in order. So in order of the sequence that you want the RGB lighting to go through, this makes life a bit easier in the software. It's not necessary, but it just makes life a bit more straightforward. So I'm basically just removing the RGB connections from the RGB node and plugging them into the Commander Core XT in the same order that they're already plugged in. So basically making a logical choice there. Now you'll see what I was talking about with the cables though you'll note that the cable from the rear fan is a little bit tight and it's also cable tied down to the other cables. Obviously this keeps things nice and neat, but it's not ideal for where I've mounted the Commander Core. Now you do have various different options with powering both the lighting and the fan power connections. And as I said, I covered what to do in that other fan video separately, if you're interested. The Commander Core XT makes life a lot easier, though. It's included with the Elite Capelix cooler, but you can also purchase it separately. It just means that you can have RGB 
and power all controlled from one unit. Could alternatively just keep the RGB node using that for the RGB lighting and then plug the fan power into the system fan headers. So you don't necessarily need something like this if you're going with an air cooling unit or some other cooler from another manufacturer. You do have the option of doing that. But this is really straightforward and a very handy tool. It also has mounting points for temperature sensors and other things. So now I'm basically plugging in the fan power connectors from the various fans. So obviously from the three front fans and from that single rear fan, plugging them all in now so I know what order they're in and also just getting them plugged in so they're ready to go when I want to power everything on. So this is basically preparing the case before we've even gone into the process of installing the motherboard and obviously other important components makes life a little bit easier. Next part, I am installing the IO shield that comes with the motherboard. Some modern motherboards already have this pre-installed. This is a bit of an older one. It's MSI X299, so it's a little bit older extreme edition motherboard, but I want to show this setup process for this. This is actually an EATX motherboard, which is an important point of note, because I'll show you in a second that this case is able to hold up to an EATX motherboard, but you do need to make some adjustments to it. Once that IO shield's in, obviously, then just putting the motherboard in place. There are standoff screws already pre-installed in there, and there are some extra ones in the box if you need them, but I found that there are ones that are pre-installed are perfect for this motherboard and for this setup. But what you will notice is once you start to put it in, the cable tray, which hides the cables away, is in the way. The good news is that you can actually move it over. So if you look at the back of the case, you'll find there are various different clips holding it in place at the rear there. And there are some extra ones slightly further forward towards the front of the case. There is a single screw that holds this down in place at the top. So you just need to undo that screw then maneuver the tray out of the clips, move it forward, slip it back down into place and then screw it back down again in the extra hole. This basically moves this tray to the front and gives you a bit more room to install your motherboard and then maneuver your cables in. Neat that they've got it there, but you can also take it out completely if you don't want it in. One thing that you will notice here that is worth bearing in mind is that the QL120 fans on the front, the cables aren't neatly tidied up there. So you might want to take this opportunity to maneuver and manipulate those cables a bit more, perhaps run them through the gaps on that tray and make things a little bit neater. That's something I didn't do and I didn't really realize how messy it was until I'd got to the end. So if you are doing this build, I'd recommend perhaps going to the effort of taking those cables out and then trying to run them around and making them a bit neater. It's a bit of a shame they hadn't done that, but you can see them and it is really painful now. I'm looking back at it just how much is sort of loosely hanging there. But once that's all done, you can then obviously go about the process of installing the motherboard. So you see there's a lot more room now on the right hand side of it. This is the ATX motherboard. If you use an ATX motherboard, slightly smaller, you won't need to worry about this. It should fit in nicely. One of the things is I obviously now have quite a large gap there, which might look a bit unsightly, but it is nice that it does have the room. Now refer to the manual and I've laid out the screws here. So if you just pause the video, you better see what order they're in. So you can see that we have the fan screws and the top left and then the motherboard screws, HDD screws, and then the SSD screws and then thumb screws, the extra standoffs and washers. So what we need is the second bag of screws, the MBD screws, which is the motherboard screws. And we're going to mount the motherboard and screw it down into the standoffs to make sure it's well screwed down and held in place. This is obviously very important to make sure that all the various points are screwed down and you should find about nine different screw holes that need to be filled in and tightened up to make sure that is secure in there. And obviously it doesn't fall out or anything else, but you can see already that the setup process is remarkably straightforward for this. We've basically got quite a bit of it done already and the other thing is obviously going to be mounting the cooler. Can I'm going to do a separate video on that and to go into a bit more detail on it. Now, once we've done that, I would run the front panel connections and the USB connections and other things through to the front. So obviously the front panel needs to go to the bottom. The USB needs to go around to the side, roughly where the 24 pin power supply cable is. So I'm just running those through to the back now and then manipulating the power cable. So as I said, I've got three eight pin CPU power cables that need to plug into the motherboard and the 24 pin motherboard power supply cable here as well. And that plugs in on the right hand side. I'm going to do a video separately on the power supply unit. If you need to know about where to plug in your cables, what cables you need and other things, be sure to check out that. I've already done one on the RM850. If 
you'd like to see it on the 750, be sure to subscribe for more. You will mostly usually find you just need two 8-pin CPU cables. This is an extreme motherboard, so it does require extra power for overclocking and other things. Uh, below the 24-pin connection on the motherboard is also the USB-C connector, so you can see that's where that plugs in. On this motherboard, there's also two USB-A connections, one at the bottom and one at the side. Don't forget to plug in the USB connection from either the RGB hub or from the Commander Core XT. These usually plug in in the bottom right-ish. You can see them clearly marked USB here. Don't get these confused with the front panel USB. This is different. So this is the Commander Core XT and the RGB hub. You don't need to plug both of these in if you're using the Commander Core XT, but if you're not planning on using something like that, don't forget to plug in the RGB hub into the USB connection. That will make sure that you have RGB control via Corsair's IQ software so that you have control over all the RGB lighting. The front panel power connections refer to your motherboard manual to work out where they are and which way around they go. You can see me looking at the motherboard manual on my phone here. This makes life a little bit easier. You can see the positioning of things like the power switch, the reset switch, and the LEDs. So you can basically work out where the connections are, which side negative and positive goes to where. It's a little bit fiddly and difficult to see so it's difficult to show in this video but it's worth making sure you check the manual so this is a 2066 motherboard so i need these small little standoff screws that come with the elite capelix cooler this cooler will actually fit a number of different sockets i'll do a video separately in a bit more depth and go into all the different things that you can do with it, it will fit the most recent motherboards as well so it is multifunctional. but here i'm using it with an x299 motherboard and a Core i9-9980XE CPU. So I'm going to mount this on the top. Now it's worth bearing in mind that Corsair says you can get up to 280 mil cooler on the top of this case and still have decent RAM set up. With the 4000D Airflow, they said that you needed low profile RAM, so just bear that in mind. I haven't got a 280, this is only a 240 mil rad so it doesn't take up too much space it uses 120 mil fans so i put two ql 120 fans to match the fans in the case that's not what it comes with as standard so it is an upgrade but we are mounting it to the top of the case so essentially the front fans on the case are already set to intake so they're pulling air into the case i've then got the fans on the radiator to exhaust through the radiator and out the top of the case and then you already have the pre-installed rear fan which is exhausting hot air out the rear so you essentially have three fans intaking and three fans exhausting and they're all going to be connected to the same controller for both rgb lighting and for power by the end of it so it should make life really straightforward in terms of the setup so once we've positioned it at the top of the case all we need to do is to basically screw in all the screws so it comes with some small screws and washers and basically making sure you mount all those up and screw them in to secure the radiators to the top and then that will then exhaust through it one thing of note is that it does come with a magnetic dust cover as you saw at the beginning that sits on the top some might argue that you should take that off and not have it in place once you've installed a radiator on there because you're not sucking air in from the top, so the dust isn't going to be a problem necessarily, apart from just falling through the day. Whether this makes any difference or not, I don't know. I personally prefer to keep it on there because you might find you still get some dust coming in from the top, even though the fans are blowing upwards, but it's worth knowing. Now, the Elite Capolix cooler has been upgraded with an LCD screen. This is an additional purchase. You can actually buy an Elite Capolix cooler with LCD display, done a video separately on this in the past and on the upgrade kit where the mounting for this is fairly straightforward this already has pre-installed thermal paste which makes life a lot easier i put the standoff screws in place already and now I just need to seat the cooler over the cpu and then put the thumb screws down you'll notice there are several cables coming out of that and i'll go into those in a second but you have four thumb screws included in the box essentially you just need to mount down on the various standoff screws that we've already installed here so just basically screwing those down gently into each of the corners being careful not to over tighten but make sure that they are tight enough that it's not going to move around and that it is nicely seated on the cpu if you do find the cpu is running too hot it may well be that this isn't secured properly and isn't tightened down enough but you do need to be very careful not to over tighten it 
so just take care here the tiny little single cable plugs into the AIO pump header on the motherboard which I'll show you in a second and then you have another cable which runs through to the back this is quite a large chunky cable this has two different connections on it one of those is a USB connection and the other one plugs into the commander core XT this basically gives Corsair's IQ software control over the pump directly from the commander core so not only the pump but also the fans and everything else as well as the RGB lighting is all controllable from one thing mm -hmm. now on the right hand side top right of the motherboard you'll see pump fan one this is where I'd recommend plugging in the single connector that I was talking about don't get it confused with the system fan headers they are slightly different you want pump fan or AIO pump depending on which motherboard you have that's the most logical thing to do and the best setup for that now you can see I've run the rest of these cables through to the rear you need to make sure you plug them into the commander core XT before powering the system on I also need to plug in those fan cables but we'll get to that in a minute you can see now basically the state of what we've got in terms of the back of the cabling and what we need to do so I'm going to tidy up now they're plugged in the power supply cables for the top of the motherboard so those three eight pin CPU power connections now everything's a in place I'm going to make sure I tidy these things up get them out of the way a little bit and ensure that tidying is done because it does make the airflow a bit better and it makes life a bit easier in terms of managing things but this cable from the CPU cooler I need to run that down towards the commander core so I'm using the cable ties here on the right hand side as well to make sure that's tidied up you can only plug this in one way there's a little gray mark on the top of it to let you know which way around that is so just plugging it into the commander core here easily slotting that in and that then gives pump control but you do need to make sure that you connect up the usb connection so as i showed earlier on basically need to run this to the bottom of the case and plug it in on the usb header at the bottom roughly in the middle so make sure you run that through to the back and then to the bottom and plug it into the motherboard once that's done we've got a lot of what is needed set up so now we're going to go about the process of installing the GPU there are thumb screws on the left hand side here which as you can see required a screwdriver in order to get off because they're a little bit tight but just basically taking those top two off if you're not already aware the top connection on the motherboard the PCIe X16 slot is usually the best one to use because it's the fastest I've also done a video separately on how to get more FPS out of your graphics card if you're not aware already so check that out and then basically just connecting that up this is a 3060 Ti founders edition card in case you're curious but it will take up to a 360 mil GPU this case so that's good to know as well quite long set up there so now I've connected up all the fans already on the case now I just need to connect up the fans that are on the radiator so again two cables get each fan two RGB cables two power cables I'm going to logically position them so that they are fitting in with the order of the other fans so you can see me taking out one of the RGB cables that I plugged in previously that's for the rear fan so now I'm putting four and five in as the top so we're essentially saying that the bottom front fan is number one the one above that is two the one above that is three then the two on the radiator are four and five and then the rear is six so this is the sequence of the RGB lighting so if you're putting a scheme into it where essentially colors going from one fan to the next this makes life a bit simpler in terms of the hardware level you can actually manipulate these things in Corsair's IQ software but it makes it a bit more straightforward to just do it at a hardware level initially plug the fan power connections in with the same sort of logic to make sure that they're all connected up side by side but it's basically on the control box that controller then needs SATA power so you need to make sure you plug it into the flat power connector I talked about earlier on from the power supply unit that then gives power to the controller which then in turn powers the fans in terms of both RGB lighting and power so if you find your fans aren't spinning it's probably because this cable's loose or not plugged in correctly so make sure you plug that in once that's all done we're now ready to go so just powering it on making sure everything's spinning up as it should be and it, here is the result a very nice looking machine now I have Corsair Vengeance RAM with RGB lighting on as well so what you can see is a lot of RGB lighting and obviously a very nice display on the Elite Capilux cooler with that LCD upgrade that screen is very useful because it not only displays temperatures of the coolant but can also be set 
show temperatures of your GPU and CPU at a glance. But you can see the glory of the QL120 fans. And I must say, it's really nice to have those set up as standard and already connected for you. But again, from a couple of different angles, you can see these sort of excessive cables that could have been neatened up a bit if I'd have realized there were a problem. But now I've obviously already tidied up a little bit at the back, so it just becomes a bit of an issue. What I did do is just put a little bit of a cable tie on the front and try and tuck them in a bit. But for the most part, it looks pretty neat. There is unfortunately that little gap where the tray had to be moved over to the right a little bit, but I still think it looks good. And a close up view of the display shows transparent housing. So this is one of the new ones. They've got three different ones, I believe now. There's a black one, a white one, and then this transparent housing. Obviously this display can be used for a variety of different things. So you can use it to show off things like your temperatures, of your CPU and GPU. You can use it as a clock display. You can use it to show the load that the things are under and the pump speed, for example, and other things. So it can be used for a variety of different things. One of my favorite uses is to use it for GIFs and that can be quite entertaining too. So obviously these are not included as standard with the case, but some nice upgrades potentially you could do. As I said, I will be doing a video separately. So if you want to find out more about how that works and see some benchmark tests for it, be sure to check out the links in the description or check out my channel as a whole. Subscribe for more and thanks for watching. Let me know in the comments what you think and whether this case is worth it over the standard 4000D airflow. This has been the Provoke Prawn. Thanks for watching.